Hey there, BookTube. Noah. Everyone who reads it must converse. Thanks for coming by. Or thanks for uh, stopping in again. Um, today I'm going to add to the philosophical sci-fi series on my channel where I explore sci-fi works, science fiction works, from a philosophical perspective. And today I'm jumping into Cloud Atlas. What an awesome book. What an awesome experience this book is when you read it. And what an awesome movie, actually. I'm a big fan of the movie. And so, in going at this, I'm going to talk about the book primarily. But I'm, I'm going to talk about the movie a little bit too because you can't really separate them. It's an adaptation. But... In understanding the different characters <clears throat> that we have going through the narratives, I'm going to talk about, and I'm going to use the actors that are in the movie, because in the, in the book, you know, the characters may be very different in the different stories. They don't have to look the same. And how David Mitchell shows you that one character is a reincarnation of another character of an earlier time or something like that is by a birthmark or something of that nature where, um, and that's all, all that needs to be said, right? I mean, it's very quick and you get what, what he's doing now in the movie, uh, they were able to do this kind of thing very easily by just using the same actors and they could change the way that they look to a large degree, you know, like uh, <laughs> Hugo Weaving is actually like a female in the ghastly ordeal of Timothy Cavendish. Um, but he's a male every other time that you see him in the movie in the different time periods. But they don't have to, they didn't have to tell you what they were doing because by using the same actor, you just get it eventually, you know? So, this is a big postmodern uh, puzzle, <laughs> an amazing uh, kind of kaleidoscopic work. And what it is, is, is a bunch of different narratives set in a bunch of, a lot of different times and different places. But what it gets at, once you read the whole thing, what the book really gets at is when you when you see the 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 work as a whole it says some very deep things and it says some very uh, philosophically minded things about what it means to be human so um i'm just going to go through it a little bit and this is by no means going to be comprehensive because there is a whole lot to unpack in this book but i think that uh that will enjoy it and um the first thing i wanted to say is that there are some very beautiful and, and pointed lines in this book that are, uh, that, that just kind of stick with me and always have. And one of them is, and a lot of them come from, uh, Sun, Sun Me 451, who is the, who is the, uh, clone. The fabricant is called, called a fabricant in the books which is a being, a human being, but that is actually created in a laboratory setting, you know, doesn't, doesn't, doesn't have a mother and father, and is created by pure genetics. And they're all, you know, essentially clones. And they are controlled by their diet and by indoctrination uh, to, 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 to not be human, essentially. And they're treated as such. They're not treated as human beings. And, they're, and they essentially uh, don't see themselves as human beings. They see themselves as more as um, machines. They are servers. They are there to serve. They are there, you know, in this kind of capacity. And so Sunmi451 says, The truth is singular. Its versions are mistruths. In, in, in the book... The whole thing of Sumi four five one is a um, is a uh, an interrogation. So that's how this book is laid out is beautiful because it's all mediums of storytelling. 
In Sunmi451, it's an interrogation. So you just have questions and you have answers and you get Sunmi451's story through her answers to being interrogated. And at the beginning, the, uh, the agent that is interrogating her says, we're not, uh, this is not a trial and this is not, there's no judgment going to be passed on anything that you're saying. Your version of the truth is the only thing that matters. And her response is, uh, the truth is singular and its versions are mistruths. And that's correct, right? Because in actuality, there is only one truth of something that happened. Now, uh, to be all comprehensive and to say the actual truth of a situation, you have to say what every single per person saw and internalized <clears throat> from a specific situation. Because that is something that does happen, right? But... How individuals see a certain situation and through their own filter, that is not capital T truth. The capital T truth is a reality of just experience. There is an experience of something and there are people, there are ones who experience that something. The, the book starts off with the Pacific Journal of Adam Ewing. And now that is um, the story in the movie where you have this kind of um, well-to-do uh, Englishman that goes on a boat to, uh, to you know, across the Atlantic. He's, and he goes and he, see, he meets that slave. And the slave stowaways on the boat. And... That story is very, very, very awesome, especially in the book, because um, that is uh, humanity. That is showing what humanity is all about. The character that is Adam Ewing is a very, very human being that is in touch with his, his inner self and that... Um, Ultimately, what he does is re he rejects brutalization of others, of other human beings. He sees other human beings as human beings the way that he is a human being. And regardless of time or place, he's willing to fight for that. He's willing to put himself on the line for that. And that is the kind of uh, being that Adam Ewing is, is the essentially human. He's, uh, throughout all the stories, he is... The, the one that is essentially the most human out of, out of any character that we're going to meet. The next one is Letters from Zelda, Zel, Zel, Zelgidheim. Now that is the story of the um, composer, the young composer, the young piano player that goes and, and has an apprenticeship. And through this, uh, through that story, we meet that guy, the young composer, of course, and we meet his uh, his teacher, the one that is of a famous composer that is teaching him. Now there there is such a this this guy is somebody who is a user, somebody who is kind of like um, it's asserting dominance over others, but not in a way of the ultimate kind of losing you, your humanity for it, but in a way of just, you know, down, down, a down a bat going down a, a negative road. And we see that character go through that, um, through, throughout multiple lifetimes as well. But the story of the young composer is very tragic, possibly the most tragic one of, of the whole story. Because he is caught in a in in a in a in a double bind where there's no way out, and he didn't do anything for to to really get there. He didn't do anything wrong to get there, but simply rejected being used and simply rejected being a pawn, being uh, pushed around in that kind of way, and ultimately. Um,
commits suicide. But not before he writes the amazing Cloud Atlas, this kind of art piece. And I think that his whole story is actually showing what it really shows is art, is that art, all art, whether it be music or the visual medium of art, but all art is a transcendental medium. Art speaks to something deeper inside of the human being, inside of the human uh, heart and human mind, that it speaks to a deeper level of what it means to be human and what it means to be a conscious, self-reflecting creature. And without art and without uh, these kind of pursuits, then um, humanity is a lot worse off for it. And that story and that character shows art as a transcendental medium. One of my favorite of the entire book, of course, is The Ghastly Ordeal of Timothy Cavendish. It's, it's wonderful to have this kind of comic. <laughs> it's, it's, it's so funny. He's a coward. <laughs> and he just gets in over his head with this thug. You know, he's, a, he's an agent, um, a writing agent. And he is representing this uh, very a gangst this gangster. Um, and he gets in over his head and in for a lot of money because he's just, you know, <laughs> inept and uh but he gets lucky because this guy gets famous for killing somebody and then we meet you know in the in the in in the movie it's shown very well see that guy is uh tom hanks's character who actually plays zach in the uh in the story uh the story is the <laughs> Is not the Pacific Journal. It's the Half Lives or uh, the Lucio Ray mystery, I believe. So Zach is ultimately the uh, redemptive um, character in the book and in the and in the movie as well. We see him. He plays that. He plays the same character that is actually trying to poison Adam Ewing. In, on the boat, and this is, you know, set back in the, you know, set back in, uh, you know, early, early slave times, you know, um, and it is, it is brutal that he's just going to kill this guy. He's going to poison Adam Ewing and steal his money, and just because he can, you know, <clears throat> and then we see him in a, more, a time more of the 20th century, 21st century even, where he is just a gangster and you know a, a very a very gruff very hardcore kind of person and he has that uh in the movie this uh reoccurring mantra and that is the uh the weak are meat and the strong do eat and that is uh the kind of thing that subconsciously drives him he knows that he needs to be um, you know, he asserts dominance whenever he can, and if he can't, then he, um, fakes it, or he hides, you know. So we see a, a different kind of, we see a kind of progression with him, and the Timothy Cavendish, his story is actually, um, a beautiful, a beautiful interlude for this book. And what I think it's showing is the fool, which uh, which we all are, you know, we all are this kind of being that, that, you know, is kind of fly by the seat of our pants and doesn't really know <laughs> what is the right thing to do. We always need help. We always need to be willing to accept help, willing to ask for help. We, uh, and the help <laughs> just might come in a way that, you know, we don't want. It might come in a way that sucks. And, uh, you know, his help is to get put into a mental institution. You know, get uh, get locked down. It's ridiculous. It's so funny. But um, it's an essential part of being human. We have to be willing to be helped. And we have to be willing to, uh, to admit that we need help. And then the major, the major part of this story and what 
uh, makes it essentially the most sci-fi is the story of the uh, Horizon of Sunmi 451. So it is set far in the future after the destruction of, um, you know, the, the, the society as we know it. And what has happened is this huge, this huge, in you know, uh, overly technocratic uh, society has been built up, at least in some parts of the world. And we're on Seoul. We're on uh, Korea. So it is um, Neo Seoul is the name of the town. And there's basically ultimate technological advances. And there are fabricants. These fabricants or ultimately clones. Now, there is a there is a group called the Union that is bent on bringing this kind of uh, system down. And why? Is because the fabricants are human beings. They are humans, essentially. But they are, uh, like I said, through diet and through indoctrination, the entire society of humans looks at them like they are not human and they are used and abused and then ultimately killed and then then you know repurposed their 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 bodies are taken and used as food and used as soap to make soap and things like that whatever we might need organic material from so there is a huge uh kind of uh, scheme to wake up all of these fabricants and to cause an uprising. And, you know, of course, well, what could they do? They, you know, they don't have any power. They don't have any means. They don't have anything to cause an uprising. Well, if your whole society is built on a slave force like this and the slaves ultimately um, quit doing their job, then the entire society crumbles. And that's what we see kind of happen. Now, uh, in that story, what we visit is a, a messiah figure. Soon me 451 becomes a messiah figure. And she writes something called the declarations. And when she writes the declarations and then has the interview that we're reading, it is obvious that this fabricant is human being, is not what they have said that the fabricants are. And at that point, the uh, revolution starts. And so we have a Messiah figure that is ultimately, uh, you know, killed, like all Messiah figures and all, uh, all you know, martyred for, for the greater good. And breaking of paradigms. In the story of Sumi 451, the, the whole world, you know, the whole human race, thinks a certain kind of way, and we need a revolution of mind. We need to break free of a paradigm. And that kind of thing happens very, very well. The kind of things that are said, um, David Mitchell does it very well, is, you know, your life is not your own. We are here for each other, essentially, guys. We are here for each other. There is no... Uh, working and bettering yourself so that you can be better and better and, and just get better. You know, we all we all progress or we all fall um, together. And that's just the way that it is. It's just the way that it is. It doesn't matter what you might think as far as, you know, well, I, I, you know, I, I made this, I did this, I do this, my, uh, I've, I've built this, you know, as far as your house or your estate or your financials or whatever it might be, that there's only so far you get without, um, other people all the time, other people helping, taking part, uh, being part of, you know, your, the, the ones that are your support system and allow you to be successful or whatever it might be. What, what kind of, what is the main philosophical um, ideas in Cloud Atlas? Well, as you know, as you can see that there is a, um, there is an element of 
personal uh, responsibility going throughout Cloud Atlas. This is a, a very Buddhist, a very Eastern uh, way of looking at the world, cosmological speaking, you know, rebirth, reincarnation. And therefore, what all the only thing that matters and the only real truth that there is to freedom because you know we're we're stuck in a system we're stuck in 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 a round and round you know cycle of rebirths and reincarnations and no matter what happens you're going to keep on living these kind of things so what is the ultimate tr truth that we have in that and that is personal choice we have a choice to be how we're going to be at each moment. And the choices are actually the most important thing in any situation. The choices that individuals make in the small uh, decisions that they have in their life and at their disposal, that is the most important thing that there is on the face of the planet. Each individual's personal choices. Now, those that have more power and influence, you know, their choice choices may seem to be more crucial. And, you know, in a way they are for that time and place. But if we have thousands of years and thousands of lifetimes even ahead of us, then the main thing that matters is our personal choices in that time, in, in the times that we are you know, in right then, because our being is going to um, either grow and expand or going to fall and, you know, contract through those choices. And we're going to do it over and over again. You're going to have, nobody is ever going to fail. This is ultimately very optimistic. And, and it might not seem so at first, but it's ultimately a very optimistic view of being human because nobody can ever truly fail. No matter how jaded or how, uh, you know, selfish, whatever uh, your mind state is, you have an almost infinite number of, of opportunities to learn and to grow and to change. So it all comes down to personal choice. I love it. David Mitchell did something uh, amazing with Cloud Atlas. And the movie is very good as well. And so uh, I hope you enjoyed this book too. And if you, <laughs> if you uh, have any kind of comments or any kind of thing, let's get into it. Leave me a comment. Check out my playlist uh, for other philosophical sci-fi in the description. Bye-bye.